I'm going to start with just a little bit of housekeeping this evening. Um, note, we are live streaming this and we also are recording this so that we can post this presentation on our website. Um, so with that being said, if you have questions, you're welcome to interrupt us as we're presenting. Ask us those questions um, that will get posted to our website. Or if you want to wait to the very end, we'll have a question and answer period. Uh, we'll stop the recording at that point in time so you're not on the, on the presentation that's on our website. And then what we're going to do is go back through and then we'll print out something. Um, we'll have like a PDF on our website of all the questions that have been asked every night. I just want to be aware some people don't want to be on the camera or they don't want to be uh, recognized asking certain questions. So just so you're aware, again, if you don't mind that, feel free to interrupt us. If you'd like to wait until the very end, then what we'll do is cut that recording off for you. So to start, my name is Jody Smith, and I'm the Director of Lands and Compliance for the Metro Flood Diversion Authority. Um, and to the right of me, I have Eric Dodds, and he is the Program Manager for our, our lands. I think you just got booed from the front row. Um, so that was early um, and gracious. So uh, we want to begin by just welcome you and thanking you for coming tonight. I know this takes a lot of time, and I know every one of you is very busy, and you, some of you have driven um, some distance to be with us this evening. Uh, I want to make sure you kind of understand what the presentation is. Hopefully you guys all got a, a handout so you can take notes if you'd like to. We're going to start with our presentation. These have been lasting anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. Again, kind of depending on the amount of questions that we have. We're going to leave some time for questions and answers. Feel free to ask us whatever questions you have. If we don't know the answer, we'll certainly go and find it and bring it back to you. Then the rest of the time is really meant to have an open house with your land agents. Um, I didn't pay enough attention to see where they're kind of all at, but we have them all set up in the back of the room here. Um, really, if you don't feel comfortable meeting with them tonight, set up a time when they can come out and meet with you. The intention is really to get you connected with your land agents to go over those flow AGs and agreements that you received. The presentation outline, again, hopefully you grabbed one of the packets as you came into the room. And we're going to talk about the flow easement development. This has been ongoing for a couple of years. Eric's going to go through the specifics of that. Uh, but this isn't a process that started three months, six months, or a year ago. It really started about two years ago. Um, hopefully all of you had heard from Crown Appraisals in that time frame. And so this was no surprise when you got those packets in the mail. Then the Floyd easement frequently asked questions. You did receive a handout and that packet that was sent to you a couple weeks ago. We're gonna go into some of those specifics. Again, feel free to ask any questions about that. And then we're gonna do a high level overview of the mitigation zones and impact summary. Again, you did receive this in your packet um, and we just wanna be available to answer any questions that you may have had reading through that. Then we're going to go into the Floyd easement appraisal process. What were the calculations that were used to come up with the offer that was presented to you? We're going to do a high level overview of the crop insurance program. Um, I, we've received a lot of questions about the crop insurance program and you guys are our, our fourth night. So we were in North Dakota for three nights last week and every single one of them we received those questions. We don't have a policy completely vetted out, but we have been meeting with a focus group trying to get through some of the concerns with that. If you have specific concerns, please bring them up this evening or feel free to reach out to one of us. Um, we'll be spending the next year really vetting that and making sure as we craft that policy, it's addressing all of your needs and of course some of the post-operation programs. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jody. Again, Eric Dodds, uh, good to see several of you again here tonight. <clears throat> so as Jody noted, I'm going to walk through a handful of slides. Um, if you're comfortable and you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. We can stop at any time and, and take those as we go. Um, so just a little bit of history. As Jody mentioned, this process started several years ago, and I know some of you have been as anxious as I have to try to get to where we are now. Um, the Diversion Authority actually hired Crown Appraisals back in 2018 to do what we called a phase one market study. And that study looked at uh, property sales up and down the Red River Valley, looking at farmland that has flood risk as well as farmland that doesn't have flood risk. They also looked at farmland sales in Missouri along the Mississippi River as well as along the Missouri River in Iowa and Nebraska. And all of this is documented in both their Phase 1 and Phase 1B studies. They found a significant amount of market data 
that they could use to define what the value of a flowage easement would be relative to farmland that doesn't flood. And so that phase one study was done in 2018. We recognized the project changed a bit, um, time had passed, and so we hired Crown to do an update of that in 2020. You'll see that on the slide here that we did a phase 1B study. And then FEMA approved the CLOMER. So that's the hydraulic model, basically identifying where the, the, the project will have impacts after the project uh, modeling has been done. That was uh, um, finalized in late 2020. And then in early 2021, we hired Crown again to start what we called the phase two study. And that was building on all the information that they had gathered in phase one and phase one B and applying that to the boundaries that were defined through the CLOMER approval process to all of your specific properties. And so that was the bulk of Crown appraisals activity in 2021. Again, as Jody mentioned, hopefully many of you met with Crown and were able to get some information from them about the appraisal process. We did have some landowner meetings back in July of last year, and I think maybe some of you attended those. And tonight, uh, now the appraisals were approved at the end of, uh, I'm sorry, back in February, at the beginning of this year. Offer letters were mailed out, and we've this is our fourth night of open house meetings here in March. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a history about you know where we've come, and this has been kind of a long time in the making. Um, next, I wanted to get into some frequently asked questions. So these are things that, again, you've probably received in your packet, but uh, we thought it would be helpful to walk through a few of these and explain some things in additional detail. Um, what is a flow easement? So this is an agreement between the landowner and one of the entities of the diversion authority. The flow easement includes a payment to the landowner and it provides the diversion authority the right to periodically and temporarily store flood water during project operations. Second question is what does the flow easement payment cover? So it really covers two items. One, it covers that right to store water when, project, when the project operates. And secondly, it, it provides payment for a restriction on development rights. And we'll get into a few of those details a bit later, but those are basically the two rights that the flow easement covers. Why does there need to be a flow easement on my property? <clears throat> so the federal government, as well as both state agencies or both states um, have defined where and how we need flow easements. The federal government defined two of the mitigation zones and then each state, both North Dakota and Minnesota, identified some additional mitigation requirements above and beyond what the federal government required. And all of those agencies required us to obtain a property right, and the flow easement is the form of that property right that we are obligated to acquire. So in North Dakota, the Cass County Joint Water Resource District is the entity purchasing those flow easements. Um, Roger Olson with the Cascade Joint Board is here tonight. Thanks for coming, Roger. And on the Minnesota side, the City of Moorhead and Clay County have joined together to form a Joint Powers Authority. It's called the Moorhead Clay County JPA, or MCC JPA. And we have Commissioner Campbell, uh, Jerry Van Amberg, Councilmember Selgebold, Commissioner Mojo. Hopefully, I'm not omitting anybody, but they're here with us tonight as well. So, thank you guys for coming. Um, another common question we have is when can I expect payment? So the flow easement is much like any other real estate transaction where there's a closing and, and you would get paid at closing. So in this situation, either the Cass County Joint Board or the MCCJPA will provide what's called an agreement to acquire a flow easement, uh, much like a purchase agreement. And that agreement will identify a variety of terms, including payment terms. That compensation for the flow easement is a one-time payment Again, it's made at closing. So in most situations, if we reach agreement on the nuts and bolts of things, we go and get that approved by the board. Uh, uh, the agreement's been signed and then a closing date gets scheduled with the title company. Um, typically that's three to four weeks after the agreement has been approved. How often is flood water going to be stored on my property? And so this is obviously another common question. <clears throat> so both the Corps of Engineers and the Diversion Authority and all of the modeling teams working for the Diversion Authority have studied this quite extensively. 
um, the, to determine how much the operation of the project would increase the depth and duration on each property. And to display that, we have uh, a, a table that I wanted to walk through with this one. I don't expect you to see the eye test, but just to give you a flavor, this is a table, it's actually 17 pages. There's a copy in these binders if you wanted to see one. Otherwise, it is available on the project website. What I'm gonna do here, so I'm gonna zoom in on the left-hand side of this table. And I'm gonna to try to use the laser pointer on the computer here. So what you can see, this is an example for OIN 176. So OIN is just a random numbering system. It started over a decade ago, just a way for us to simply keep track. Uh, you're probably familiar with your PIN number. Um, your PIN number is like 14 digits. I know you don't memorize your PIN number, but it's about as long as a credit card number. It's obviously hard for us to keep track of that long of digits. And so uh, about a decade ago, each property was given a, an OIN number. It's two to four digits. Uh, again, just random for us to keep track of, of parcels. So in this example here, you could find your OIN number. The next column is called the approximate minimum field elevation. And so this is an elevation. It's likely lower than most of your field, but it sets a reference point that we can use for reading this table. <clears throat> so then in this example, we have columns for the 20 year flood, 50 year flood, 100 year flood is in yellow and 500 year flood in red. And under each one of those flood events, we have a water surface elevation. And then we've calculated how many days will water be above this field elevation. And so this part of the table is the existing conditions. So showing you what would happen today if we had any one of these flood events. And in this example, what you can see down at the bottom, there's no flood impact on this property until we get to a 500 year flood. And under a 500 year flood, there's 1.7 feet of water. So the difference of 925.7 minus the 924, 1.7 feet for approximately six days. It doesn't mean it's that deep for all six days, but there's water above that field elevation for six days. So in the next slide, up here on the heading shows you the width project conditions. So again, we have the 20, 50, 100, and 500 year flood events, but this data is for width project conditions. I can go down to the bottom where I extracted that information. Again, no impact under the 20, 50, or 100 year floods. Once we get to the 500 year flood, you can see 1.9 feet of water for nine days. And so it gives you an example. Again, this is just one that we randomly grabbed, but you can find your parcel and see where the impacts are on your parcel. Um, back to the FAQ for a few more things here. Um, so why are the restrictions on my property different from others going through the process? So again, the, the mitigation zones were defined in part by the federal government, the Corps of Engineers, uh, the North Dakota Department of Water Resources and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. So each one of them have different requirements on where we need to acquire flow easements. Those three um, entities have then defined those areas which have been split into four mitigation zones. So the upstream mitigation area divided into four mitigation zones. I'll get into a few more details of that in a minute. Another question is, will I need to clean up my land after the water recedes? So the Diversion Authority has committed to assisting property owners with cleanup for impacts caused by project operation. Again, I've got a, a few slides where we can talk about this in more detail later, but in summary, we know that the flow easement payment goes to the property owner. We also know that we're familiar with flooding around here and the floods bring debris, they bring corn stalks, wheat stubble, you know, whatever, raccoon carcasses. I mean, you can imagine all sorts of things that come with the flooding, um, erosion of roads, variety of things. And so the Diversion Authority recognizes that that will be an operational impact to the farmers in the area. And so this cleanup program is intended to be additional mitigation above and beyond the flow easement payment. And again, I'll speak to that in a bit more detail later. 
A few questions about farming. Um, can I still farm or lease my land? Yes, the flowage easement allows farming to continue. There will be some restrictions on development, but landowners do retain that right to farm, to lease your land, install drainage, uh, farming will continue. Will this impact my crop insurance? No, your ability to purchase federal crop insurance remains unchanged. But in addition to that, the Diversion Authority has agreed to and committed to providing supplemental crop loss protections that are not covered by federal crop insurance. So I, I've got a, a few slides later, we'll get into that in more detail. But as Jody mentioned earlier, and, and I'm echoing now, uh, the Diversion Authority has committed to providing these supplemental crop loss programs. Um, with that, I'm going to move into the mitigation zone. So hopefully you've seen these maps before and hopefully you're somewhat familiar. Um, the mid upstream mitigation area broken down into four different zones. Zone one is by far the largest, um, approximately 25,000 acres and unfortunately the most restrictive. The total upstream mitigation area, the combination of all four zones is between 28 and 29,000 acres. And again, zone one is about 25,000. So in zone one, most restrictive, we need to acquire all the buildings and remove the buildings in this zone. And there's a prohibition on development in zone one. Zone two is also defined by the Corps of Engineers. This is an area primarily uh, in Richland and Wilkin counties. It's along the river and along some drainage ways that lead into the river, um, a smaller area. Um, this area again, defined by the core. Uh, development is allowed in zones two, three, and four, but there are restrictions on how that development occurs. All of those restrictions are identified in the actual easement document. Uh, zone three, so the state of North Dakota, the Department of Water Resources is the regulatory agency they require some additional mitigation, additional flowage easements beyond what the federal government required. And so they've asked us to include mitigation zone three. Again, this is primarily areas in Richland County along the river, uh, as well as a small pocket in Southern Cass County. Similar to the North Dakota, the state of Minnesota, the Department of Natural Resources has a permit condition and requirements that we expand upon the federal mitigation zones. So mitigation zone four is an area in Wilkin County. This is the county line is right there in the north edge. Uh, so all of this pink shaded area is in Wilkin County, again, primarily along the Red River. These are areas where the state of Minnesota required additional mitigation. Um, the next couple slides here are showing the depth, flood depth information for the project. And on the left-hand side, what you can see is the existing flood depth conditions. This is for a 100-year flood event. So if we had a 100-year flood event, um, as you see in the title there, the 2009 is the flood of record, and many of us are familiar with that. Uh, the 2009, according to all the latest hydrology, is approximately a 50-year flood event. Um, so if we did have a 100-year flood event, you can see the depths. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see that a lot of the depths in Cass County, in particular, are in that three to four foot range, some of them a little bit deeper, but generally in that yellow category, three to four feet. On the right-hand side, you can see the 100-year flood event with the project. And of course, the project has impacts. It has a, a larger area that's being flooded and the floodwaters are deeper. Up in Stanley Township, in what we call the Camel Hump area, that depth is eight to 10 feet. You can see in Minnesota, some of those depths are in the four to six foot range, um, up in section 17 and 18 and further north. And then further south of there, they, they taper off to two to three feet and, and, um, and shallow. The next slide then is a comparison. So this is what we call the depth difference. So this would be the difference between the width project minus the existing. And of course, here you can see, of course, there's impacts uh, up in Stanley Township again, the depth difference of eight to 10 feet, 
uh, four to six feet in, in other areas and then tapering down to, to less depth difference. The next couple of slides here talk about duration. Um, again, we're unfortunately maybe familiar with flooding around here. On the left hand side, we have existing flood durations for the 100 year flood event. You can see quite a few of those durations exceed 14 days. Um, quite, a, quite a red area there on the existing map. And then on the right hand side, you can see the flood durations with project. And interesting to note that there's some durations that are less than they are under existing conditions. Um, keep in mind, there's a giant channel that we'll be building that will drain out that area. And that's the short version of why there's less duration. The next slide then shows the duration difference. And so again, a large area in the sort of middle of the camel hump, uh, middle of the staging area that has a duration of less, a, a duration difference of less than one day. And then some areas, of course, here in Minnesota where we're in the eight to 10 days tapering down to six to eight and, and shorter. So again, this is for the 100 year flood event. Um, next, to talk a little bit about the appraisal process. If hopefully some of you did have a chance to meet with Crown, if you did, you, you might be familiar or remember seeing this graphic here. Um, so the basic point is what I mentioned earlier, uh, through all of the research study on appraised values and market values for farmland, the appraiser concluded that we really need to compensate for two items. One is that restriction or loss of development rights and second is the increased flood risk. So collectively, those two items equate to the value of the flow adjustment. So as they work to apply their findings from the research work to farmland, they concluded that the loss of development rights, again, depending on one of those four zones, ranged from eight to 10%, and the increased flood risk, depending on the location, the depth and duration would range from seven to 30%, for a total reduction in value of 15 to 40 percent. This is a percentage of farmland. And so the next couple slides here go through an example of how that gets applied to an actual, in an actual appraisal report. So what you see here is a screenshot of the first two pages of an appraisal report. And you'll notice on the right hand side of the screen here, this example parcel has three different zones. So 23 acres affected by zone one, a little over seven acres affected by zone two, and just under three acres affected by zone three. So we tried to gather an example that has a little bit of complex math to show you how that might work. The next slide here shows you a screenshot of pages three and pages four of the appraisal report. And in this example, you can also see, hopefully you can see that, um, that there's two different land use types on this parcel as well. There's tillable farmland that's valued at 6647 per acre, so $6,647 per acre. And then there's also wood, wet, grass area. So this is probably river bottom, areas that are valued at $2,500 per acre. And so we've got three zones and two land use types. The next slide here shows you how the math works on that. So it won't be any homework, I promise, but just to walk through this quickly. So you can see there's three different zones. So on the bottom, zone one, zone two, and zone three. And up above, we have a calculation for each one of those uh, values. So for zone one, 23 acres, again, in the wood wet grass or river bottom land valued at $2,500 per acre, the appraiser assigned a reduction percentage of 17%. So you do that math, you end up with 97.75. For zone two, tillable farmland valued at 66.47 an acre, a little over seven acres, again, appraised reduction percentage of 16%. You do that math and you end up with 75.93. And then similarly for zone three, you do that math and you end up with 2941, sum those together and you end up with just over $20,000. So in this case, that's how the math works on this parcel. Again, I would suspect most of your appraisals are not quite as complex as this one. There may be some that are even more complex. 
Um, next, I'm going to segue into some of these mitigation programs. So we've touched on crop insurance and the debris cleanup programs. I'll go into some detail on that here. Uh, first off, again, just to echo some of Jody's comments. So the Diversion Authority has a long commitment to helping ease the potential burden on both landowners and ag producers. Again, we know the flow easement payment will go to the landowner who may or may not be the actual farmer or the producer. And so with that as kind of a backdrop, these two programs, the supplemental crop insurance program and debris removal after project operation were really targeted for the, uh, the producers. Um, on the crop insurance side, we've retained a company called Watson Associates. Some of you have met with Alex Offerdahl. He's um, one of the principals with Watson Associates. Watts is a crop insurance development firm. Um, as I understand it, they develop roughly 90% of crop insurance products for Federal Crop Insurance Corporation on, an, on a regular basis. And so they're clearly an expert in the field. Uh, we'd reached out to them several years ago. They are working to develop the supplemental policies. Uh, we have had a couple of focus group discussions, uh, one thorough meeting with Alex in the focus group um, this past fall. And there's two programs, two supplemental crop insurance programs that are coming out of that. One is for prevent planting. And the second is for summer crop loss as a result of operation of the project. Um, so the policy details for these programs are not fully developed yet. Uh, the project, of course, won't be operational until the 2027 crop year. And so that's roughly five years from now. We know that crop insurance is dynamic and there may be changes between now and then. But our goal is to have a draft policy for both of the uh, crop programs by, this, by the end of this year. We know that that's important for producers and we know that that's important for all your decision making. To go into a little bit of detail on these, so again, the first one, prevent plant crop insurance program. So this will apply if due to project operations, producers are unable to plant crops by the established late plant dates set by federal crop insurance. Um, the plan for this is to reimburse producers at the same coverage level that you currently purchase through your federal crop insurance program. Uh, this supplemental program will provide it at no cost to the producers. And there are provisions to include uh, the yield exclusion uh, that helps make sure you don't have a, a long tail on a yield reduction or near, in your APH. Um, many of you are probably more experts on crop insurance than I am, but um, I understand that that's an important facet. The next one, growing season supplemental crop loss program. Um, so this would be used in a scenario where if the project would end up having to operate during the summer and flood out crops that are growing. Um, there's never been a flood event in history that would have caused the project to operate in the summer. The project will operate when we reach 37 feet. Uh, the largest summer flood event has not triggered that level. In fact, it's been several feet lower than that. And so we don't anticipate that this program ever needing to be used. But that being said, if the project did have to operate in the summer and the gates would go down and flood out growing crops in the upstream mitigation area, you would likely would not be eligible for federal crop insurance. So the Diversion Authority recognized that, recognized that the likelihood is very low, but the consequence for producers could be uh, rather severe. And so we've committed to this growing season supplemental crop loss program that will provide coverage up to 100% for resulting crop loss if the project is operated in the summer. Again, this will be provided at no cost to producers. Uh, there'll be insurance riders that will be available to all of your crop insurance agents. So as you sign up for crop insurance on an annual basis, um, you identify how many acres of corn, how many acres of wheat or soybeans or whatever it is you're growing. 
you'll check some boxes, say, yes, I want to sign up for this rider on an annual basis, much like you sign up for federal crop. And the diversion authority will be paying the premiums on that and providing this no cost to producers. Um, eligibility for the crop programs, again, um, need to be growing crops in the upstream mitigation area and participating in federal crop insurance. Um, and again, working through your existing insurance providers to sign up through that no cost rider made available by the diversion authority. So um, we've got, I think, a pretty good framework for how these programs are gonna be uh, developed and administered. But of course, there's still things that are in development. So how will farmers enroll each year? I think we talked a little bit about that through your usual crop insurance signup campaign. How are farmers determined? Again, you have to be farming in the upstream mitigation area. Um, how much are premiums and who pays them? Again, the diversion authority will be covering premiums. How will claims function? So much like you have a crop insurance adjuster today, if there's a claim, you call your insurance adjuster, he comes out, he, she comes out, looks at the situation, has all the evidence, makes a conclusion of, of liability, damage claims. Um, as we move forward with this program, we've had some discussions about, should we rely on that one insurance adjuster? Should we have two insurance adjusters? Those are some details that still need to be ironed out. Again, we've had some of these conversations with the focus group, uh, but these will be key items as we move forward this year. Um, when do farmers get indemnified and who is the payee? Again, I think that's kind of an output of that in, uh, insurance adjusting process. Um, whether there's payment from your normal federal crop insurance program or whether the supplemental crop insurance program steps in. And then, of course, you know, how are their disputes? How are they addressed? What's the recourse? Again, these are key things that need to be identified in the, in the policy documents. So a couple of just examples that we thought have been helpful to explain to people. So the four different examples here. Um, first one, torrential sleet, biblical scale downpour destroys crops after they have emerged. So who pays? In that first example, there's no discussion or comment about the project, the project operations or anything else. And so we have to assume that the regular crop insurance would apply under the first example. Second example, cropland is submerged throughout the planting season and the diversion gates are closed through the final planting dates. Pretty clear here as well, project causes the impact, the supplemental crop insurance would, would apply. It, the project prevented this farmer from planting. Uh, third one, so cropland is submerged throughout the planting season, but the gates never closed. So again, we know that some of this area has a flood impact today. And I know that that's maybe more common on the North Dakota side than it is here, but nonetheless, under this scenario, the gates didn't close, the project didn't cause the impact. Regular crop insurance would apply in that scenario. And then the fourth one, there's an early spring flood. The gates are closed, the water comes, the water recedes, and the crop is planted, but it's planted two weeks later than it normally would have been planted in a typical year. And as a result of that, there's a 10% yield reduction. Uh, so which one pays? So in this scenario, again, we've committed to that 100% coverage. The supplemental crop insurance program would, would pick up in this scenario. Um, segue just a little bit into the post-operation debris removal. So again, there's kind of two parts of this. We know that there's the vast majority of the upstream mitigation area is privately owned land. And so in those situations, um, we would define the boundaries based on each flood event. We know each flood event is gonna be a bit different. Notify property owners, the diversion authority will retain contractors to help implement this program. So these contractors would be available to help pick up the debris, um, help with restoring any damage that gets done. In the settlement agreement, there's also commitments to establish a subcommittee to really dive into the details of this. We know that each flood event will be different. If there is a debris field, typically it's gonna be along the ridge of where the water extends to, uh, but depending on wind action, depending on the, you know, where the source of the flooding comes from, that debris field will likely be different in each flood event. The, the 
extent of any debris will likely be different. And so um, I think the approach to resolving or mitigating that impact will be different as well, whether we conclude that it needs to be burned, whether it needs to be tilled in, whether it needs to be picked up. I just, I can see there's a variety of scenarios. There's also some public lands in the upstream area. And so under those scenarios, the diversion authority will really sort of mirror uh, FEMA's, FEMA's disaster assistance, allowing the government entities to contract for whether that's a, a culvert that gets washed out or gravel that gets washed off a road and you need to repair that damage. Um, the, the townships, cemeteries, et cetera, will be able to go and do that repair, um, submit reimbursement to the diversion authority for that cleanup. Then last thing to um, talk about these is we've modeled this project extensively. Uh, one of the most modeled river systems in the United States. So we have real high confidence in the modeling, but that being said, again, every flood event might be different. And so if we're proposing mitigation in a certain fashion and something different happens that is unforeseen, or if you as a property owner feel like you're impacted by the project, this alternative dispute resolution board has been formed and it's really an administrative process where you can bring forth claims of damage or claims of impact. There'll be uh, 13 members that would be candidates to sit on this board. Anytime there's a claim that gets made, there'll be three members that get independently chosen, randomly chosen out of that group. Those three members would then hear the claim, you know, weigh all the evidence, and make a recommendation whether there needs to be additional mitigation or not. This is a program that's been modeled after something the North Dakota Department of Water Resources has had for several years uh, regarding the Devil's Lake Outlet Project. Um, we have had a number of questions about the Alternative Dispute Resolution Board in the last few open house meetings. Um, so some of those questions regarding you know, who sits on the board so again, there's uh, 12 counties all surrounding um, Cass and Clay, you know, up and down the valley, along with the state of North Dakota would be asked to identify a representative to sit on this board. Um, ideally, they would have, the candidates would have some experience with flooding or flood mitigation or appraisal or something that would be related to uh, the, the disputes that we think might be likely, but that's just a recommendation each county really has the authority to identify their own representatives. Um, talk a little bit about next steps. So again, we're here tonight and again tomorrow night. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to meet with or talk with your land agent. If not, I, several of them are here tonight. Uh, really looking forward to ramping up negotiations. Um, I guess I'm happy to say we have had a number of property owners that have already said that the uh, appraised values looked fair and they were agreed to signing their agreement. And so we're, we're already uh, moving forward with scheduling some closings. Again, typically the closings are three to four weeks after an agreement gets approved and we just get in the queue of, of waiting for the title company and, and title work to be done. Um, I've mentioned the project website a few times. So fmdiversion.gov, uh, on the top of that website, there's a lands button. If you go there, you'll get a screen that looks kind of like this. I've highlighted in blue on the left side, the flowage easement uh, section. So if, if you're familiar with the project website from the past um, and you haven't been there for a couple months, we have done a pretty extensive makeover. Um, and so hopefully you'll find the information more available and readily accessible for what you're looking for. But again, on the, on the lands website, there are four main areas. On the left-hand side, you can see a slide talking about flow easements. And on that flow easement page, you'll find some information about the acquisition process and schedule. You'll find the presentation that we gave here tonight. You'll find some of those maps that I shared earlier, um, contact information for your land agents, the FAQ information, uh, sample flow easement and agreements, as well as the phase one and phase one B study materials. So. Lots of good information out there. If you're looking for things, uh, just want to point that out. Of course, work with your land agent and hopefully they can answer most of your questions as well. And the last thing I had was just contact info. Again, I'm hoping most of you have already talked with your land agents, but in the event you haven't, here's the contact info. 
Um, again, several of these folks are here with us tonight. So that is um, wraps up all of our slides. Happy to take any questions if you have them. Questions? You were supposed to bring the beer. No. <laughs> I've asked I've asked Jody to unlock that cabinet in there. I'm sure that's where Just it's Just one at. on the uh, cleanup. If you know, sometimes you can't. If the firm wants to clean it up, you can bill. I'm sure there'd be some limitations, but that. I didn't see it in there, but that was yeah. an option. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So a question about the cleanup program. What if the, I mean, most all of you are very capable and probably have more experience doing this. Um, yeah, the settlement agreement and the expectation is that if producers, if farmers or landowners want to pick up the debris themselves, there'll be provisions to compensate um, landowners for that time. And um, your rates will probably be lower than... Matt's yeah, Matt's, but... You booed me, so I had to fight back. I appreciate yeah. it. Is there any modeling as far as changes in drainage, you know, with uh, the tieback of the uh, where water goes now, as opposed to where it'll go? Is there a, an overall drainage map? Yeah, a question about drainage. So, um, and I, I suspect your question is probably focused on lands close to the embankment, although I understand. It's really flat around here, and so something miles away may have some trickle-down effect. Um, with each segment of embankment that gets designed, there is a very detailed local drainage plan. <clears throat> but in addition to that, there's an overall local drainage plan for the entire um, southern embankment portion. Um, so the areas in, well, I guess we can talk in specifics about any one of these areas. Um, drainage in the camel hump has kind of been a focus and maybe back up to one of these maps that can help talk through. Um, so the, the camel hump is, I guess Jody calls it Texas. We're used to calling it the camel hump, but nonetheless, it's the area in Stanley Township where the embankment goes up. So drainage in that area has been um, an area of lots of discussion. I think drainage along Southern Bankment Reach 4, there's been, of course, a lot of discussion. There's a lot of drains that go directly uh, west to the river, and they'll have to be cut off and carried you know, along the embankment. And so there are drainage details available. I don't have the details of that here tonight, but we can certainly talk through that. Was it all for me in a day and because the water can go west, a lot of it might go more to Comstock. So they're having, and I know you're addressing it. I'm sure. Sure. It's, there's a lot of things yet. But, yeah. I, I, I've seen the, so the question about local drainage and will it impact Comstock. So I've seen the sub watershed breakdown that shows where that water comes from today and where is it going after the project. Most of these areas, as I recall the maps anyway, uh, go west, um, but the areas that go through Comstock are really largely unaffected because the Wolverton Creek will remain in place and, and uninhibited by the project. Um, but that drainage that does go west will have to be collected along the embankment itself. There'll be a large drainage channel uh, on both sides of the southern embankment. It's called Reach 4 is the north-south segment. And one thing I the railroad, I would rather deal with the IRS than the railroad, but the railroad goes through there, and uh, good luck with dealing with them. I just have to, because both ditches, you know, that goes right through Comstock, and sure. that's where a lot of the water goes, but they are easy people to right. deal we, with. We, yeah, just anecdotally, I mean, we've had some successes working with the railroad on the project. I know there's still some design work ongoing in that location specifically, so. Um, understand you yeah. well happy to take more questions again we're hoping that uh, you have a chance to meet with your land agents hopefully this was somewhat informative for you and 
um, yeah, we're planning to stick around. So.